Lenfest Center of the Arts where everything is very orange or if not orange a complimentary to orange yeah see lots of navy in the crowd and that's a good thing um, yeah so uh, it's wonderful to see all of you here and let me start by giving my immense thanks um, to the supporters of this event um, this symposium was generously funded through a Lenfest junior faculty development grant as well as through funding from the Dean's office at the school of the Arts, the Heyman Center for the Humanities, and the Writing Program. Um, I simply couldn't have held this event without the support, and I am indebted to these offices for their administrative support and care, and thank you to everyone here who may be part of those places. Um, I have more thanks. I also want to take a moment to thank personally some people who have given me extra help and love in planning this event, which include Professor Timothy Donnelly, Dean Carol Becker, have in the back, Dean Jana Wright, Dr. Susan Derange, Hannah Reisinger, Kay Zhang, um, Professor Eileen Galuli, Professor Heidi Julevitz, John McShane, Bill Wadsworth, Professor Sam Lipsight, Christina Rumpf, Brendan Regibal, and Sean Marr, among others. I'd also like to take a moment to give my immense and endless thanks to Gavin Browning, who we have in the back, who's the Director of Public Programs and Engagement at Columbia University School of the Arts, and who has worked with me every step of the way to help me plan and shape this event. Gavin, thank you for all your care and assistance and preparation for today. I simply couldn't have done it without you. Um, I'd also like to take a moment to thank the presenters of this symposium. Uh, it is beyond my wildest dreams to have such esteemed poets and writers um, that, who have agreed to be part of today, to share their voices and perspectives, and to be part of this conversation. Uh, it's so wonderful to have my heroes here, and I can't thank you all enough for being part of this event. The inspiration behind this symposium arose in classrooms here at Columbia. In my classes, particularly my undergraduate ones, I often have given the assignment to my students to write a poet's essay, so as to complete, at least in part, a requirement for the course that didn't involve actually writing poetry. I have always seen this assignment as a sort of curricular intervention, as a way to ask them to write an essay which is not on its face critical or academic in nature, but a poet's creation. This task would often confuse or delight them and probably most of the time do both. They would often ask me what this could possibly mean. A poet's essay, does this have to have an argument? My answer, always, or not necessarily. Or more often than that, my answer to their questioning, no, no, it doesn't. There would often be more questioning when I told them to not think about essays they had written before for their other classes when they are writing this one. I am not sure I answered any of their questioning well. In many ways, I created this symposium to help answer their questions about the assignment and my own. The ideas behind my poet's essay assignment seemed simple to me at first, of course, but with their questioning soon became complex. Really, I was asking them to work against the form of the essay they had gotten so used to in their other classes, and this created a kind of valuable educative tension, or at least I hope it did. It is true that the essay form, especially in our country, has become both a symbol and an enactment for a kind of stilted learning, a fault or limitation of the imagination, an SAT response to the question of nothingness, existence, and radical love. Bah humbug. Because if we think of something as banal to many of us in here as the five paragraph essay, we can see how the root of a limitation in our imaginations take shape. Obviously, this overused form is something that a writer may or may not work against, but for the children living in our nation right now, this is the end goal of much of their education up until at least 12th grade, especially if they are lucky and are going to a school that hopes to prepare them for advanced learning and a career. But even in our esteemed universities such as this one, perhaps the point too is to write a five paragraph essay, albeit with sophistication, to take the form and do it well. It is perhaps the idea that to have an elegant point and to prove it well is the point. This is as far as so many people ever get in their thinking about the matter. This is not to suggest that argumentation is inherently wrong or, or even evil. 
Quite the contrary, I believe the construction of, Earth, of a thesis or a projected outcome to set out and then to carry through is a worthwhile academic endeavor. It certainly is correct in many fields to have a projected goal or plan. I just don't think it is the only valuable way of creating or narrating a path of one's thinking. And I also don't think it gives space for the aesthetic logic necessary for the creative process, which is perhaps the most holy space of all. As we move forward into this new century, I want our thinkers and writers to move beyond this linear thinking into the realm of what an essay by someone like Montaigne might do. His work is one such example I have cited in the advertisements for today, and of course we can think of many others, and I hope we will during the course of this symposium. Still, his essays do as they say they will. They test out ideas. They are unafraid to get messy in their execution. They are brave enough to go forward into the uncharted waters. In them, it's completely beside the point to get back to where they started, let alone where they'd say they would go. They are simply beside the point. It's true. Today, I hope we'll challenge some of your beliefs of what a poet's essay might or could be and what it can do. I hope that you will begin to think of the concept of a poet's manifesto as something to be played around with, and to begin to think of an ars poetica folding back within the essay form. I hope you will consider the notion of poetics not as a dry material, but as a frame to hang ideas from, and that the fantastic things our fantastic speakers will bring to you today will help you reconsider what a hybrid genre might mean that it doesn't have to be a lens with which to market a piece of writing, but that it is a formal gesture with the aesthetic logic of something, like a poem at the forefront, where the emergent truth is so much better than the projected or planned one. I hope today will make you think of things you couldn't have ever thought you might think about. So if you look at the schedule of the program, you can see that today is organized around several parts. Um, we have a series of short talks organized loosely into some themes, I guess I would call it that. Um, and after uh, three presenters present, then we'll have a little Q&A, and we'll do that three times. And then at the end of the day, Fred Moten will deliver um, our keynote address. I also want to demystify the ticket process for today, if it is still mystified. Um, if you came in here, you received a ticket or of some sort, and you want to hold on to that if you, you know, want to leave. Um, but uh, if you do leave with your ticket, that in and of itself may not get you back in, because if while you're gone someone has taken your spot, um, then the ticket itself, you know, will, will not get you back in. So anyway, um, just to keep that in mind, not to create anxiety to stay, <laughs> because you're free to go, but that um, I think we're fine now, but that, you know, could, it could be that um, it would be hard to get back in. Um, but, you know, if you don't want to leave and just, you know, keep your spot, if you feel you would um, like to see more of our Lenfest Center for the Arts, um, please do not hesitate to check out the exhibition, which is, I believe, two floors down on the sixth floor at the Miriam and Ira D. Wallach Art Gallery. Um, there's a wonderful exhibit called Arthur Mitchell Harlem's Ballet Trailblazer, which is celebrating um, the life and accomplishments of the New York City Ballet's first African American star and the founder and longtime director of the Dance Theater of Harlem. The gallery is open from noon to six today, so hopefully you can check that out. Um, and we're going to start our presentations off with Ariel Goldberg, Ken Chen, and Wayne Kestenbaum, who have written pieces under the theme of logic, aesthetics, meaning, and memory in a poem essay. So I'm just going to read their bios right now, and then they're hopefully going to um, come up, and it's just going to be an alphabetical order. So Ken's going to be <laughs> first. Sorry. <laughs> just, yeah, I can't, can't fight with the alphabet. I, I, well, I guess you can, but <laughs> um, anyway, so yeah, so we'll start. Um, uh, with Ken, but before I do, just want to thank everyone for being part of today. And um, Ken Chen is the executive director of the Asian American Writers Workshop. He is a recipient of the Yale Younger Poets Award, the oldest annual literary award in America, for his book Juvenalia, which was selected by the poet Louise Glick. And NEA NYFA, or NYFA, I guess as some people would say, and Breadloaf Fellow, Chen co-founded the cultural website Arts and Letters Daily and Culture Strike, a national arts organization dedicated to migrant justice. A graduate of Yale Law School, he successfully defended the asylum application of an undocumented Muslim high school student from Guinea detained by Homeland Security. 
Ariel Goldberg's publications include The Estrangement Principle and The Photographer. Goldberg's research, writing, and performance work has been supported by the New York Public Library, the Franklin Furness Fund, uh, ESO MoMA, SOMA, SOMA, anyway, uh, in Mexico City, um, and Smith College. From 2014 to 2017, they organized readings at the Poetry Project. Goldberg currently teaches at Pratt Institute at Parsons, the new school, and writes for Art in America. They are working on their next book, Heavy Equipment, Prophetic Gestures in Photography's Recent Past, which examines the language that LGBTQ photographers use to relate to their subjects before the digital revolution. Wayne Kestenbaum has published 18 books of poetry criticism and fiction, including Notes on Glaze, The Pink Trance Notebooks, My 1980s and Other Essays, Humiliation, Hotel Theory, Best-Selling Jewish Porn Films, Andy Warhol, Jackie Under My Skin, and The Queen's Throat, which was a National Book Critics Circle Award finalist. His new book of poems, Camp Marmalade, will be published in March, this, this March, now. It's, it's, it's out now. Um, he has had solo exhibitions of his paintings at White Columns, uh, 356 Mission, and the University of Kentucky Art Museum. His first piano vocal record, Lounge Act, was issued by Ugly Duckling Press in 2017. He is a distinguished professor of English, comparative literature, and French at the Cooney Graduate Center in New York City. So please join me in welcoming our first speaker, Ken Chen. This is my durational work. <laughs> um, okay. I want to thank you all for coming and uh, thank Dottie for inviting me. This is such an amazing lineup. It's probably like the first event I've done in a long time where I felt like nervous and self-conscious because everyone else is so amazing. Um, so, what can I say? I'm gonna read a piece that's from this book that I've been working on that is called The Death Star. And uh, it's about how uh, my father passed away in 2012. And as a result, I started going to the underworld to try to uh, cause a return migration back to the land of the living. Um, and if you have lost someone, you probably have realized that you kind of turn into the zombie who can't feel things properly. And uh, it is this sort of like um, shock to the system. And so while this was happening, you know, I'd do events for the Asian American Writers Workshop or for Culture Strike, and you know, there'd be a lot of writers and artists who'd talk about the history of colonialism, and I would also read this sort of thing, and there's this sort of sublime trauma in what I was reading that uh, I immediately recognized. So um, I realized that when I would go to the underworld, I would also see everything that had been destroyed, and there has nothing there's nothing that has destroyed the world as much as like transatlantic capitalism. So um, in a way, the underworld could be a place where I could meet you know, everyone who had died and go to all the countries and places that had been destroyed. Um, so that's sort of the context for what I'm going to read. And this image really doesn't have that much to do with what I'm going to read, but we had the option to do AV, so I thought I would spice it up. <laughs> Um, this is from, well, might be in this project or might not, but um, it's a map, and it's a map from 12th century Sicily that was reproduced by a German um, map maker centuries later, and um, it's a map of the known world, and the original version of this was made by Muhammad al-Adrisi in Sicily, and Sicily, uh, not many people know, was a Muslim a North African state for like 500 years until everyone was deported. Um, and there were a few centuries where all the kings were uh, Normans who spoke Arabic and like were like oriental, like decadent uh, potentates. Um, but this map I found made by Altrusi, it blew my mind because um, one, it's so beautiful, but he, had, he mapped the whole world from, uh, from like Korea all the way to the Canary Islands, North Africa, uh, 
uh, Central Asia, Finland, United Kingdom, Sri Lanka, Ceylon, uh, everywhere. But you might notice that it looks nothing like the world that we know. And the reason why is because he integrated these different map making traditions. Uh, one of them had uh, Mecca as a center of the world in the top. So the orientation is reversed. So if you look carefully, the top is actually Africa, the middle is the Mediterranean, this side is Central Asia and India. The top part that is totally underdeveloped is Europe because everything was sort of happening in the rest of the world. And so I thought this was an amazing map because it was sort of like a map of uh, like a time outside of coloniality. Uh, and I, I also think that you know, one should be like a little suspicious of a kind of non-colonial nostalgia because most of these places were, you know, uh, despotic states or they were linked to the kind of process of colonialism. But at the same time, I thought there was something so beautiful about um, this sort of map and also just like on a very material level, like, like the way, it, it actually has a lot of information, like distances between cities and things like that, but it's done in such a like, beautiful, organic, decorative kind of way. Um, so part of the piece I'm gonna read is sort of about imagining that kind of time or space. Um, and it's called Anti-West, or The Beginning. In the A was the word. Let A be beginning. Let A be alpha and alphabet and aleph. Let A be seeing all creation from a lone point, the E ephemera his metamorphosis into ephemera. If this end formed an origin, let A be the sea. You buried him above the giant hole called ocean. In what whole universe have you been birthed? If you are a writer, in the beginning was the word. What is a beginning? This is the book of the generations from the West and from the rest, spoken from a voice, from a void, from a place of rest. So many races and people and species brought forth, limbs and babies and bodies birthed and fruited, spores of generations, first and second seeding genus, class, logical collections, the race of reason across the man age. And the beginning was tohu bohu. What we saw upon the surface of the deep was darkness. What is the darkness? What this chaos, was this chaos what an Aximander named Arche, the limitless principle prior to even the heavens and the cosmos? When I read about this substance, I thought about Mare Tenebrosa, the sea of darkness that the late medievals believed to shroud Africa, whose center lay a secret from the Europeans, who could only imagine white sanctuary hidden there, white jewels glinting from the palaces of the pious Prester John, who ruled an interior empire of gems and crystals giants and centaurs, this Christian potentate inspired by Orientalist fantasies, but who symbolized a promised cavalry that would save the Crusaders from the forces of Islam. The Europeans still believed in Prester John, even in the 17th and 18th centuries, as Portuguese ships tacked their sails against the winds of another world. What is Portugal? The knights want to wage crusade, and so the knights sail from England. But along the way, the knights say, why not? Let's do it. Let's pillage Spain. And that's Portugal. What is the beginning? A few days after it happened, the three of us came down the hill. I mean myself, my sister, and my stepmother. We clutched yellow bills and blue dollar bills. Dollar bills issued by the Federal Reserve Bank of Hell. We stopped a thousand feet from home. My stepmother laid out our cauldron on the asphalt. We stuffed sheets of shijie rubao into the cauldron. We lit the newspapers. The tapered lighters flame weak like a tear. We said nothing. We held the hell money. We were mourning at solitudes. We dipped the hell money into the flames. The flames first tentative and then vehemently engorged. The gluttonous flames. The flames hot enough to dry our tears. 
this is when, this is when our neighbors came. Our neighbors came wearing sunglasses and moved with the curious leisure of those on vacation, though they were simply returning home. Our neighbors came, perhaps, noting to themselves, these people have erected a bonfire on our driveway. Perhaps our neighbors characterized this as atypical suburban behavior. Our neighbors knew this is where he died. We noted them. We cried without self-awareness. We stuffed more bills into the vessel's hot music. Note after note, heaps of hell money. We took on faith that flames sublimated the dollars into the next world. Wire transfers to Inferno. We cried. And this is when one of the neighbors spoke. One of the neighbors said she saw him. He had been driving down the hill when she saw him, coast into the shoulder where he braked and slumped forward into the steering wheel. Was this too much information? Did I want to think this image? Did I want to think this image? What is twilight? When we burnt money to send to hell that afternoon, I saw the sun decline into the early white evening and sink into what our ancestors had called Hesperus or Vesper. These words engendered another word, the West. For does not the sun sink into the night at its western point? What is the West? In 1503, Columbus found himself stranded in Jamaica, where his men initially welcomed and were given food by the Taino, until those matriarchal tribesmen betrayed those who imagined themselves as their benefactors. Relying on a prediction of an upcoming lunar eclipse, Columbus supposedly admonished the Taino that their god would inflame the moon to punish them for not aiding Columbus and his men. When the indigenous men saw the moon redden in the sky, according to Columbus's son, they let out a, quote, great howling and lamentation, unquote and, quote, came running from every direction to the ships, laden with provisions, praying the admiral to intercede by all means with God on their behalf, unquote. This trope, the superstitious native cowering before celestial fate and Western rationality, often appears in colonial literature, from H. Ryder Haggard's King Solomon's Mines to Tintin comics. In a counter-parody, the Honduran Guatemalan writer Augusto Monterosso imagines a Spanish friar who threatens that he will blot out the sun if indigenous tribesmen attack him. The natives kill him anyways, since they have already predicted the eclipse using Mayan astronomy. These stories deploy the eclipse to suggest Western mastery over both Dionysian primitives and the Apollonian heavens. But their lays were pressed within this image a more accurate subtext. What hungry womb swallowed the sun? Walk west where the world ends. What is the sun? If he disembarked not from Spain, but from West Africa, that Italian captain. If this is what writers refer to as foreshadowing. If the Santa Maria and the Nina and the Pinta were smaller than tennis courts. If he piloted from dead reckoning navigating against his past like an animal. If soon they saw naked people, if the people were well-built and strong, if I saw their good bodies and handsome features, if I displayed my sword and one of them, not knowing what it was, grabbed it by the blade, if in return he cupped in his bloody palms a parrot, if the bird's green feathers caressed my hand, such strange comfort after these months at sea. If I thought to myself that with 50 men we could subjugate them all. If the people were nude of immunity. If we forgot we made homes where the maggot ate. If you gasped when you learned the number was 100 million. If you did not know that death had undone so many if the arteries of these ghosts drifted into the rock, 
If a ghost is what we call history minus body, if the wound where we drew the silver from their veins was called Potosi, if you read about the gold and the silver of the dead continents, the quote, in two men in minds of the Aboriginal population, unquote, as the first item on a list, if the second item was the conquest and looting of the East Indies, if you read the last item, the quote, turning of Africa into a warren for the commercial hunting of black skins, unquote, if this genesis list consisted of a syllogism, if this colonial alpha signalized the quote, rosy dawn of capitalist production for a young political economist named Karl Marx, rosy dawn of that sun, the Death Star. In the beginning was the word. If the West was where the night began, night equals end, not equals beginning, equals anti-West. In the anti-West was the word. In the beginning was the word. If beginning, arche, means archive. In the archive was the word. Ergo, anti-West equals archive. But the West invented the archive, so West equals archive. Ergo, anti-West equals word equals archive equals West. Ergo, anti-West equals West. Error, wrong. If your father was a man, if she tries to snuggle, you commit genocide. If you commit genocide, you are a bad man, to say the least. If two years later, your infant on your chest does doze. If all men are mortal, wrong. If your father is a man, wrong. If your father was a man, what does it mean to say the least? We call the first and second sentences false conditionals. One, no causal link between snuggling and genocide. Please proceed to snuggle. Two, logical syllogisms cannot create moral value. If you commit genocide, you must be imagining things. If you are genocide imagining things, you may be what the West calls romanticism. If you are imagining things, you are still not a zombie. If your spirit evacuates your unzombied body, there may be reasons. If what happened was beyond reason, to say the least, what does it mean to say the least? If to say the least is reason, if mathematics like money and markets summon zero morality, if all persons must make their way to an end, if an end means both purpose and termination, if empire is a name for administering the ends of persons, if syllogism extends a ruse of comprehension, if syllogism implies what happened was reasonable, if modus ponens suborns us into carceral recursion, if what we wanted was a world as small as comprehension, if all we are left with are words and the dead, what is wrong? A wrong is a line in space that has been placed above another line in space. A ladder is when we climb one wrong after another and we find ourselves late. What is late? You are belated if you lag behind the colonial power. You are late if you are recently dead and a proper noun. Related, beloved, belated, relation. The late Simon Chen. Thank you.
Good morning. It's really an honor to be here, so thank you, everyone. So I took this prompt from Dottie to think about um, what haunts me as a writer, and it, that's primarily captions. So I'm going to stretch that over the course of the essay. What if everything poetic was a caption? What if everything poetic um, is also what gets edited out? Um, so I'm thinking a lot right now about lost captions, and that's sort of what I'm going to be reading from. These are sort of preface remarks, if you need a guide. And yeah, I've been doing a lot of like, what if I was a historian type of writing through the lens of a poet and a lot of like glossy art magazine critical writing where a lot of poetic inclinations get edited out. So I use the space of this essay to sort of cram in or uh, accumulate all the edited out uh, things that fall through the cracks. Her cassette tape recorder was on just in case because she came all this way and she was not sure what the photographic sessions would yield. She knew there would be facing page captions with excerpts of these recorded conversations. Some people inside the pictures decided to use their caption space for an excerpt of a poem. Legs of light stands extended from their compact travel position, smooth metal descending to grip the floor. Is it too much equipment? Thick shutter precedes an answer. To imitate the sound, I flop my tongue across the bridge of my mouth, suction, clack, slurp. It just occurred to me in doing that, apertures are vaginal. But if you put a microphone next to even the softest, fastest sound, it turns to jabs. Like I misread the tone of your message. Punctuation gone awry. Asterisks. Assumptions implode in gestures. Comfort versus desire versus first impressions embedded in this routine of making images. Reverse. Retreat. I'm translating the mechanism amidst the stiff air of people just getting to know one another. Pop of synchronized lights, flash goes off mixing with the natural light. Her film advances by a lever, getting to a new frame gives pause, advancements, crunch, roll up, the darkness of inside the camera follows the grooves. She adjusts the shot or repeats it, hoping for another facial expression to loosen up. Nails of a dog's paw scratch against the wood floor, following a kid into the room. Why are there silver umbrellas on stands if it's not raining inside? It makes the light softer. It bounces on this umbrella, then it comes back, and it's not so bright. The kid says, oh distrustfully. Then she demos it. It's still pretty bright, the kid says. So this is what I imagine. Off the records of my research, it clearly requires fantasy. I'm walking backwards from where and when I was not there. I am inside the mega caption of Joan E. Byron or Jeb's papers at Smith College and now sifting through the materials, messy notes, cell phone photos. Jeb still has all her slides, negatives, work prints, final prints, vintage prints at her home in Maryland. So I was essentially inside all of this textual material. The yellow glue of eye to eye, the book binding cracks as soon as I open it. So this is Jeb's first book, On Top, Eye to Eye, from 1979. It's out of print. She self-published it under Glad Hag Books. The pages become loose leaf. I try to keep their order so the captions can match. And this is Jeb's second book, Making a Way, below it. 
how to encounter sideways documents to process them in between genres, poetry versus history, studying not only what's in the archival papers of a life's work, but swooping through handwriting to catch the marginalia to the photo history's supposed margins. With Jeb's turn to video after 20 years of still photography that was mostly portraiture and protest documentation, much of the dialogue between her and her subjects that I have been searching for or imagining in the correspondences and release forms of her still photography is all of a sudden included in her video camera, which quite literally recorded sound and image together. I'm drawn to the raw video footage for its revelations of various contact points between a person holding a camera and those who stand before it willingly or by accident. There are roughly three categories to the video footage. In-home interviews with members of various LGBT communities across the country, conference panels relating to LGBTQ issues of the late 80s and 90s, and then the national marches, demonstrations, and parades. Much of this footage she used for short and feature length documentaries through the 90s and the 2000s. In the descriptive space of my time travel, the before the march and after the march is what I'm drawn to. First I feel the energy of gathering in the streets. Jeb pans a crowd and rainbow streamers blur with the sidewalk as she walks closer to the action. The laborious and careful work of permission release forms evaporates with the supposed contract of public space. It's 1992, a New York City Pride Parade, and someone on a loudspeaker is making an announcement for Pink Ribbon's $1 donation. They're sized like pin the tail on the donkey, light pink, not the blood red ribbon that crosses in a loop at the top that visual aids began to popularize just one year earlier, which is now the mainstream symbol of solidarity for not only people with HIV and AIDS, but causes like mothers against drunk driving. People Jeb doesn't know are waving for the camera, perhaps a nervous tick to say, I see you watching me. Meanwhile, the exhibitionist photo release form resides in their leather thong and Jeb zooms in. Someone with a t-shirt that reads Dyke has a pair of pliers in her hands as she tries to finish making a pair of huge dangling disco ball earrings. She just can't get it, bending over no work table, muffled speech, I think she says, at least one is already in my other ear. The barricades have not been rebranded over time. White stencils on it's a boy, periwinkle blue, do not cross. The police stationed firmly and recognizably in my meanderings that might be misunderstood as nostalgia. A leader of dykes on bikes is ready to unleash the first bundle of marchers. She comes to the front of the line and faces them, leafy green Central Park to her right. As the conductor faces her brood, she tilts along her hunk of metal, signals it's time to start with just a cigarette glued to the wet envelope of her inner lip. Leather vest buttoned for cleavage, short cutoffs rubbing against her clit. The revving of engines is uneven. Rows of vibrators on wheels, whoopee cushions amplified to a stadium audience. Their noise cancels out whatever excited mix of bored conversation Jeb was picking up to her left and right. Is it starting yet on this corner or that? I understand these in-between things, these footage edited out as records of contact, as subliminal captions, they are my magnet. Do we need captions? <laughs> like material so history doesn't get lost. And by need, I don't necessarily mean that I trust the captions as fact, as subjective as fact has become, as unfixed names are and changing places and attitudes. But without the effort of a caption, how can different eras communicate who can't sit around on a couch and talk about their photos inside albums? Who doesn't have the luxury of human contact between generations? All right, so this is another section called Justice for the Caption. 
There was one photo in the several photos the curator showed at the museum's discussion of queer photography that I was certain I had seen before, yet she claimed the photographer was unknown. When I took a work print of this Betty Lane photo out of the plastic sheet fitted for a three-ring binder, a New York Public Library archivist walked over so quickly to my station at the shared wooden table that her scarf began blowing in the air conditioning like the wake of a ship not lost at all in the vastness of the ocean. Why do you need to take it out of the sleeve if you are not allowed to photograph the photo, she asked. Well, just to see the caption information on the back, I responded with conviction. Mind you, I was wearing white fabric gloves, or were they latex? When looking at the pencil marks on the backs of photos, on the backs of Betty Lane's photos, I look for a first name and then a last name. Both, maybe, and sometimes. Was the photographer friends with the subjects or just acquaintances? Were they a known public figure standing behind clusters of silver spray paint color microphones? Depends on who you ask. So this is a picture of Betty Lane by Paul Grant. Um, two cameras, usually in the street, Betty Lane would have one strapped around her neck, the other wrapped around her wrist, one for black and white film, the other for color. Certain levels of automation in terms of which one she grabbed. And here, one camera is on the floor. Maybe they're at a consciousness raising group, maybe a meeting, maybe the caption says, and I've forgotten. Betty Lane in action nonetheless who maybe gave permission to her with a nod of recognition, maybe didn't, maybe wanted their name attached to their image, maybe didn't, to be named four or five decades ago versus in the now, for the name of the photographer to be known, for the image to be circulating without her, all possible combinations happening at once. What does an absence of names in the caption indicate about who the photographer took the photo for? Maybe it was unmarked because the people who saw it just knew who was in it, or was it just the opposite? I pause before arguing for full and frequent recuperation of captions for photos from political and personal movements near and far. What I don't know is hard to sit with. When I look at pictures now, I wonder what will they look like 30, 40, 50 years from now? What mood of information will be distorted? Whose names will be lost? How does the longing to understand this material in this original context and the boomerangs of now, how do I represent lesbian feminist, black lesbian feminist activity and resistance from a perspective that feels trustworthy, however incomplete? how to incorporate the lived and material differences between subjects and photographers or critics and the artists they write about. All I know so far is this is a Betty Lane photo, which is more than the curator of the Feminist Center at the big museum said out loud. Lesbian Her Story Archives, this is an Instagram screen grab, posts an image with Lane having signed her name right below it in the border before the mat crops the image. This photo actually leans on a bookshelf in the archives exposed to the elements of dust, foot traffic, sweating drinks from public events, collective meetings about meetings starting on time. At one archive, you can't take the pictures of the pictures, but at another archive, you can photocopy the pictures, not for reproduction, but for research purposes. I write to someone I thought was there at the protest, but it's the wrong email, or it's an old email. Now I have a new email to try. Someone must know this photographer. Someone must know the people here. It can't be harder to find than a good thrift store upon arriving in a town with a substantial retired population. But what about the person holding that sign and the balloons and the one with the can of soda? Now I have the name of the person that manages the photos at the Instagram for the Lesbian Her Story archive, Saskia Sheffer. My goal is to identify people inside the photos I write about, and I don't care how long this takes me. How to find people in a crowd, how does a crowd, a public space, a demonstration shift the focus away from individuals, how to go back to the individuals. So this is the last little section. Endurance of obsession, errata. 
When writing histories that attempt to honor multiple participants and actions between the visual cultures, often surface level engagements, I want the textual matter that lingers nearby. I want to go into the memories around the images, the relationships that made them. And then there is this feeling, I am barely going to escape a margin of error. I have a fact-checking question for you, I announce, as I hug a friend at an opening for a show they curated. As soon as I see them, I'm reminded of a dangling claim I did not have hard evidence to support, and I imagined it being thrown back at me. Quote, is the permanent collection predominantly comprised of art by white gay men? Unquote. I apologize even for getting into facts. I lost my small talk, where did it go? We agree, I should really just email the registrar. Anyway, congratulations, I mutter and scurry to another half circle and try again. But how to fact check identities? What blind spots make themselves legible? And what if the publication edits out the pronoun that would signal this person is gender nonconforming? Sure, trans, sure, looking on the other floors of the building for a single stall restroom. The dailiness of those lost captions, long character limit fields lifted, illegible gender in its in-betweenness. And this is a correction from the New York Times from September 2017. An article on page 16 this weekend about the growing prominence of gender fluid artists refers incorrectly to Diamond Stingley, an artist. Miss Stingley is not transgender. The article also refers incorrectly to Sadie Benning's series of photographs. They are portraits, but not self-portraits. Recently, I signed a contract saying I would avoid writing about artists I knew or had relationships with. I signed a contract saying I would not show the writing to the artists I was writing about before publication. But I wish I signed a contract saying I had to check I represented the work accurately with the artists I was writing about. When a mistake is made and the online version is updated but the letter from the artist is not included, we lose the process of seeing this misrecognition. How can we show the process more? How am I doing on time? Okay, all right. In a free pamphlet at a two-part exhibition, a recollection predicated that Tiona Nakia McClodin curated at the kitchen on Julius Eastman, which just closed a few weeks ago. Um, it had a bunch of contemporary artists responding to Julius Eastman's work and also a lot of archival material on him. And it was accompanying a month-long performance schedule of Eastman's black minimalist musical compositions that were performed in New York City, mostly in the 70s and 80s, and he was up in Buffalo in the 60s. McClodin, in this pamphlet, makes a call for more direct conversation between artists and those who are writing about them and their art. McClodin says to Lady Sasha Jones in an interview, quote, and this is Tiana McClodin, the weakest part of this exhibit is the limited presence of Eastman's voice articulating who he was and his own conceptual practice. I have told all the artists to consider the fact that this could also happen to you and such is the importance of writing and speaking about their own work. Eastman's press coverage, while pretty steady during his Buffalo years, was not primarily focused on speaking with him. It was interested in talking about him and his music. That's a phenomenon that is replicated across the art world today, where you have more people talking about you than are talking to you. And things are put in print, and that becomes your legacy. So I'm just going to close with a, a few questions to stretch this idea. Like, can an unpublished letter to the editor that points out errata um, count as a lost caption? Um, I wrote a letter to the New York Times also about um, that article where there is a correction about an artist being misidentified as transgender and other artists' work being self-portraits, but actually they were portraits and they didn't print it. And so I'm, I'm interested in that sort of lost material um, that lives in email archives. So letters to the editor, they don't quite fall through the cracks. They bounce back up on that trampoline of restless poetic matter, ready to be melted down and repurposed for the next thought process. The correcting of mistakes with online content often happens with deleting and maybe quote unquote fixing things that are accidentally wrong or perspectively egregious. And then there is always the contentious or falsified information one, one realizes contentious or falsified after posting it. The announcement of a correction is a thing of print. It's when the New York Times 
had a print error that they then had to announce the correction. So is the caption also a thing of print? It's certainly vulnerable on screen, subject to scroll, to extraction. But we had scissors before we had screens also. There is immense use to language beyond my clinging to lesbian histories, to black feminist histories, including alternative texts so images have embedded captions for text-to-speech software, for people who don't use their eyes to see, for the world that isn't the sighted world. Thank you. so great to be here and to hear those very moving and precise um, compositions with their interesting procedures of stacking and um, palimpsest, formally as well as um, materially very moving and interesting. So, the poet's essay. I'm gonna read something I wrote, but for a, a, an impromptu preface. Um, I've learned over these decades that whatever I write, whatever my intentions about genre, it will be perceived as a poet's essay, even if no one knows for a fact that I am a poet or has even read a poet of mine, but there is the envelope of either disdain or permission or exception granted to the poet's essay. So if I write a poem, it's, I don't mean this in a paranoid register either, it's just how genre functions in um, encounter, in, in relation. Um, if I write a poem, it's often an essay. If I write a novel, it's an essay. If I write a, a very factual, objective essay, it's a subjective poet's essay. So I don't, my relation to genre at this point, and maybe ours, I don't claim anything unusual in, in my relation to genre is um, hands off a little bit. So I've, since September 2007, September 2016, um, I've been drawn to write fables, particularly when asked to write an essay about art. Um, and so when asked to write a poet's essay for this occasion, I of course said, well then I will offer you a fable. So I wrote three little fables called The Cheerful Scapegoat, which is the title of a book of fables I'm assembling, and I chose the one here that seemed most appropriate for the occasion, the cheerful scapegoat. Crocus was the first to appear at the party. She wore a dress designed by Adolf Gottlieb, a frock checkered with ideograms. Within the ideograms, she'd seek cognitive replenishment, and yet the doctor had warned, don't turn, to inanimate patterns for emotional gratification. Thus, Crocus had decided to break her monastic vow and attend the party. Crocus, upon entering the house in which the party was held, hid in the vestibule. She studied the ideograms on her dress. Would these conical intersecting shapes provide a road map for the evening? with circles and X's and arrows, overlapping with a glee practically catatonic in its excess, decode the arcane niceties of her fellow partygoers, whom Crocus had not yet met, given that she was still cowering beside umbrellas and overcoats in a dim vestibule, a pathway to a party that both her doctor and her miscreant confessor had aggressively urged her to attend. I won't enter the party, thought Crocus. I will telephone my miscreant confessor. Certainly he will give me advice. What happened to Crocus's good cheer? Wasn't she still fantasizing about summers by the lake, humid idols, Idols from someone else's childhood, not her own. We will skip over the rest of the party because other narrative duties await us and Crocus has grown unappealing as a focus of dismay. 
Our dismay, an ermined entity, needs larger sway than Crocus can provide. Suddenly remorseful for having abandoned Crocus in the vestibule, we return to her plight and pose as the telephoned miscreant confessor to whom Crocus had placed just a moment ago a call in danger of being intercepted by this ham-fisted voice we are currently occupying, lacking another voice with which to articulate the distance between abstraction and figuration in the war game rooms where decisions about nuclear eventualities are broached and bartered. And a half hour of animated conversation took place on a cell phone between the miscreant confessor and Crocus, who took shelter in phrases that we, posing, dispensed. The miscreant confessor then vanished, and Crocus made short work of the party. Newly bold in her Adolf Gottlieb dress, she sauntered from clique to clique. Do you want to see the host's bedroom? asked a fashionable mortician whom Crocus had befriended. Crocus took the mortician's hand, and the two friends walked down a hallway to a door left ajar. Pushing open the door, Crocus walked toward the bed. The mortician refused to follow Crocus into the room. The mortician had a narrowness of viewpoint considered a sine qua non of artistic skill in earlier centuries though her tendency to truncate every vista into a still life deprived her of the boldness she would have needed to be an effective companion and chaperone of Crocus, whose lability and chromophobia placed her in pickle after pickle, a domino effect of faux pas from which she would need to be extricated by a companion exclusively committed to Crocus's wheel. Deprived of chaperone, Crocus stood over the bed where a woman was lying on top of a man. Both were mostly clothed, though there were significant absences of habiliment, patches of disorganized skin showing through shirt flap and pajama fissure. The woman who had a moment ago draped her body on top of the man raised herself and stood beside Crocus. Together, this woman and Crocus looked down at the man who remained face up. Something unformed and infantile about his features provoked in Crocus a spasm of revulsion, as if she were looking at a Chardin painting for the first time and not knowing how to interpret her ecstasy, a conundrum which forced Crocus to shove her rapture into a different medicine cabinet a hiding place christened disgust. I finished with him, said the woman to Crocus, and now he's virtually lifeless, a passive slob, dreaming of unsolvable equations. Do you regret it? asked Crocus, newly enamored of this woman, because of her suave way of jettison responsibility for the man whom she had blown. I don't yet know you, said the woman, whose name Crocus would momentarily learn was Jesse, but something neutral and flat in your demeanor suggests that we might together form an army. An army of two, asked Crocus, already tired of being relegated to the position of meek questioner. I have other soldiers at my disposal, said Jesse, enigmatically brushing the hair away from her sweaty forehead. The man on the bed woke from his stupor and said, Jessie, introduce me to your new friend. I don't yet know her name, though she seems to know mine, said Jessie. Crocus volunteered the newest member of this bedroom's army. Pleased to meet you, said the man. Pleased to meet you, Crocus, said the man on the bed, whom we will nominate as the miscreant confessor in a new prone guise. 
The hall of mere sensation overwhelmed Crocus again as she tried to sort out the dramatis personae in the bedroom. Am I a judge, wondered Crocus, or am I a colonel in a tiny militia, or am I simply a party goer who stumbled into the wrong room and should quickly exit before I lose control of myself? The, the party's host barged in. Hello, friends. What rebel convocation are you spoil sports forming behind my back? Many years ago, before the political catastrophe that now threatened the nation, Crocus had loved the host, a tomboy named Tadeo. Once a Theodora, later a Tad, and finally a Tadeo, the host survived on the hefty earnings that came to her through sacrificial channels, sub-legal, sub-rosa, sub-material. The sub-materiality of Tadeo's sacrifices, rituals that harmed only the spirit but left unmolested the body, accrued interest through clandestine and reputedly aqueous transactions, which gave her the resources to throw legendary parties, each of them featuring a new sacrifice. Crocus, of course, was the party's secret sacrifice. Crocus knew it, everyone knew it. Only the miscreant confessor did not know. And that ignorance is why the miscreant confessor dim-wittedly forced Crocus to attend the party. So sectarian and convoluted were the workings of Crocus's destiny, we are surprised that she had enough pluckiness and composure to put on the Adolf Gottlieb dress without ripping it in the process of pulling the too tight sheath over her head and attempting to slither the uncomfortable rayon over a body that no longer wished to accommodate a dead artist's ideograms. And now it is my turn to lie down on the foul bed, said Crocus. No, said Tadeo. The sacrifice that pertains to you is happening later tonight in the music room. Beside the harpsichord, asked Crocus, who in this metropolis did not know about the notorious harpsichord of Tadeo McCrae? Are you afraid of my harpsichord, asked Tadeo? Of course Crocus is, grumbled Jessie. Fool she'd be not to fear an instrument designed to tangle up the minds of everyone within hearing range. The amorphous and unnamed man on the bed, whom many in the army had typecast as the enemy, was in fact a distant descendant of Chardin. The refinement of the keen-eyed ancestor had trickled down to the man on the bed, who saw the situation around him with a lucidity that permitted him to realize that all perspective lines converged on the cone-like consciousness of Crocus. The man on the bed wiped his mouth to free his powers of articulation from the imaginary impediment that slobber represented to a paranoid subject. Tomorrow night, Crocus said, I fly to Nice. No, said the man on the bed. No, said Tadeo. No, said Jesse. Each no sounded rehearsed. The pitch of each negation was eschatologically precise without tremor. Instantly, Crocus gave up her plans to walk down the Boulevard des Anglais. She gave up her plans to take movement classes at the hotel. She would find a movement studio here in town. She would begin movement classes the next day if she survived the party. If the still unscripted events destined to take place that night around the harpsichord left her sufficiently that's something. Left her sufficiently unscarred. The crocus did that, <laughs> definitely. What kind of movements am I attempting to learn, thought crocus. The answer didn't matter. Most important was to plan to learn how to move in a new way. 
even if these newly baptized methods had no basis in material or spiritual fact. I will begin my movement classes tomorrow morning, Crocus murmured later that evening as she stood beside the harpsichord, the circle of party goers surrounding the instrument and the sacrifice. I will learn to move like a swan or like a tugboat or like an iguana. Tadeo and Jesse smiled at Crocus, who was a good learner. Rameau's ornamentation was difficult for the harpsichordist, a local hack to master. Executing these ornaments required knowledge of period practices. The harpsichordist's mordants were clumsy, and Crocus felt stung by their maladroitness. The harpsichordist, who could no doubt sense Crocus's dismay, placed that dismay on a distant shelf in a clavier consciousness whose only duty tonight lay in the parsimoniously shaped phrase, the intrusively plangent appoggiatura, the strategically irregular trill. To leave, na to leave Crocus now in her circle of flagellance at the mercy of a crude harpsichordist and a thrill-hungry group of behavior experimentalist show experimentalists shows no cruelty on our part. Our sympathies lie with Crocus. We admire her cheerfulness. She brings mirth and contrast to the monochromatic, humorless rooms through which she passes on her slow journey toward tomorrow's movement classes, taught by incompetent masters with no grasp of kinetic fundamentals and no tenderness for the bodies whose flesh is subject to the palpations and distensions of movement sages without scruple. We admire the movement teachers, despite their unethical haggardness. Tomorrow, I will find a new way to move, Crocus continued to murmur. The harpsichordist ignored her senseless mutterings. A good instrumentalist must pay strict attention to the tempo. Without a steady yet flexible pulse, the, peach, the piece approaches Ruin. Ruin might be a good goal, however, if Crocus's sufferings are to be our guide. Crocus's consciousness burned down to the slimmest filament of plausibility. And yet, its flame continued to attract flagellants and admirers. Around Crocus, the admirers stayed fast within their circle formation. The admirer flagellants held hands to keep the circle serene and firm. Crocus began to dance, if you call those stumbling steps a dance. The movement class was already in process, and it had no teacher. I am already where tomorrow told me I must wait for it to arrive. Crocus said in a loud, clear voice. Her dance collapsed a cross between resurrection and ruin, attained a new fixity and vividness. This dance is where we, is, this dance is where we must all now live, she continued in her bright, confident tone. She staggered and regained balance and staggered again. The circle of flagellant admirers clapped their hands rhythmically with a ferocity veined by igneous strands of kindness. To call our behavior kind, to call this congregation civilized, requires an imagination addicted to the fumes that rise from notoriety. Who is notorious tonight? Crocus is newly notorious and will remain so as long as she continues to carve out through non-movement a movement class without master. Now we must efface this sordid investigation 
by rubbing a turpentine-soaked rag over the figure's already smeared features. Thank you. So it's, I'm excited about all the resonances too between the, all of our presentations, so I'm sort of catching hold of those in my memory of what just happened. But um, I moved kind of quickly and impressionistically through some materials that maybe if I just say like, I'm really interested in writing about a place and a time and relationships that I wasn't personally, uh, you know, in real life there. Like, I wasn't born in the 70s, so, um, so I think I'm dealing with both the sort of lassitude and the fluidity of, like, how one must rely on imagination and fantasy to access those places, and also the sort of um, desire I have for accuracy and for um, representation um, through whatever writing I do that honors the people who were there. And, that, and I think one of the roadblocks is like, you know, like Betty Lane, one of the photographers whose work I showed, um, like she, she passed in 2012. So, you, that, and then the other photographer whose work I was talking about, um, Joan Byron, she's still living, so there's challenges for each of them in terms of like how one co-authors memories and memories become hybridized based off of the sort of dissonant voices that are constructing them. Um, and the meaning is, I think, I, I hope that it's flexible and varies based off of interpretation. So that's sort of, you know, it's like the dance, the movement class for Crocus sort of like <laughs> awkwardly. Uh, fantastically, but also seems to be a, a means of survival. I, I don't know. Um, my, when I started writing poetry, I tried to write some poems that were sort of using uh, operations of reason. Um, and I think it might have been inspired by the LSAT, um, but also there is like a classical Chinese poetry where uh, if you just look at the characters, it kind of reads like logic problems. Like, um, if the moon did not no longing, it would always stay round. Or, if the gods had desires, they too would age. So I kind of thought that was cool. But then, in retrospect, having written a lot of that stuff a long time ago, it, it occurred to me that maybe it was because I didn't feel, maybe it came out of like insufficiency or like feeling I couldn't write like the more normal like lyric poem that was all about myself so I could go to reason. But then in working on this project, I think the, so in that, those poems there's a lot of things where it's like me writing like a logic poem about heartbreak or something like that. And there's, there are these points where the logic keeps breaking down um, and it's like a critique of logic. But then um, in reading about the history of colonialism, you know, of course you learn about the role of reason as like a kind of colonial, you know, knowledge is power, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think I was trying to think about how I could reuse those same kind of structures, but in ways that maybe were saying something that was both like more political, but also kind of more metaphysical. Um, and 
maybe uh, two like more specific things that inspired me. There's a great poem by uh, Norbese Phillips that's on YouTube that uh, I don't actually remember the name of it right now, but um, but she keeps doing this thing where she she keeps changing the words, and it's like this almost like a computer program, uh, and it, it's one of the best things I've ever read on like language and power. Uh, and what was the second thing I was going to say? Um, yeah, so I guess that, that's sort of where I came to this. And my, as I listen to these, and I, my response will be kind of comparative. So I was interested in three kind of prosodies that the three, just to generalize a little bit, I mean, I was struck very much in yours, can about like like so-called anaphora, but like if particularly the passage with if this, if that, if this and that this. So that I think when it's stacking is what I might have said when I began that you were using, as I heard that, you were using a, pr a prosody of stacking to get at something that, that the part of an essay, would, the essay part of that would be that there actually was material that could be unearthed and it would be unearthed through the investigation of the stacking. And I think in Ariel and yours, that there was something about like assembling, it, as I heard it in a way, the material that got lost through the glossy magazines contracts or through the air conditioned archivist room that, that, that that move, moving through the slivers of material was a sort of a kind of a, a way to find things that you wouldn't know. And I think in my, my procedure in that way to get at the logic, I mean, I think was the, using um, the structure of plausibility or implausibility as a kind of plastic material and to move forward in an investigation, superficially fictional, through testing out using syntax to test out in each sentence the edges of plausibility and implausibility and to, to use the kind of tr the inner drama and vertigo of that negotiation of like is this sentence gonna you know which side do I even want to be on plausible or implausible to move forward to, to material that I wouldn't find my way to otherwise or consider mine to find not claiming any kind of um, alchemic or divinatory powers, but that using structures that aren't maybe, you know, whether like and from anaphora to syntax's ability to float plausible and implausible things by just suspending the sentence as a way to um, enlarge one's powers of finding. I was just thinking a little bit more about memory and thought we could talk some, a memory, which is, yeah, related to what everyone's saying, and thinking about, um, obviously, the image of the father or, you know, the figure that is maybe coming undone and going to look for that person in the underworld, and this idea of the, the caption or, like, the ephemera, the letter to the editor, all the things that kind of get thrown away um, or taken away or not kept, not preserved, not archived. And then thinking of crocus potentially as a symbol for memory, I'm not sure <laughs> what we would say. Um, but just that, that idea of memory is this thing that we long for, we long to keep, we long to preserve. You know, we're very, like, there's a source of anxiety um, if that we were to lose it, you know, that, that memories would just kind of fade away. And so, you know, I guess that's maybe the idea behind history in some way. Um, so I guess the question um, for you all is, uh, you know, just thinking about writing your piece, do you feel that we always lose memory or do you think memory is something that is preserved? <laughs> They're a very serious person. <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> <you>. <laughs> or, or answer whatever you want. <laughs> I feel like we're at, you know, maybe like the UN or something. <laughs> it's this table, but <laughs> yeah, poetry, really poetry, uh, you, uh, something. But anyway, so yeah, I just I won't start. Maybe start with oh, you want to? Uh, well, you want to go start again? <laughs> You're right here, but whoever wants yeah, to start, sorry. yeah, yeah. Sure. Um, yeah, I, uh, memory. Um, so I, I think maybe when I was a 
I feel like talking about this is kind of making me realize how like my process is so like dialectical and like a lot of what I'm doing is like kind of refuting like how I used to write. Um, and I think I used to think that poetry was like about what is yourself and uh, what, what is the most meaningful thing you have to say. And then, and how could you write something that was very pure about like what is yourself, what do you remember? But then once I did that, I kind of felt like there was something kind of selfish about that. No pun intended. Um, and I thought, well, how can I write about stuff that is external or like political or historical or impersonal or meaningless um, if the thing that seems meaningful is like subjective? Um, and so I tried to read about everything that happened in the last 500 years, which hasn't worked out very well. But, um, but it's also like very difficult for me to write because at the end of the day, I still write in a way that's very subjective. And so uh, part of it is like, how can I write about like an impersonal or a historical memory if, I'm, if my mode is still like about personalization or subjectivity of writing? Um, and so part of it is about memory that it's like about setting down like what actually did happen in the past. But then another part of it, which I thought like kind of thinking about what you're saying in terms of if like I, this thing and the heart support actually, uh, I feel like this piece, it, it could, there, there's like another 20 pages that I just sort of had to stop and kind of reminded me of like Baroque harpsichord where it could just like go on forever, you know, like you just start the song and it like keeps playing. And uh, I think that um, part of it is this sort of like if then kind of uh, domino kind of effect falling. And for me, like I, I was thinking about if as like both this kind of logical condition. And when you read all the like political history, it is all to the sort of like, because of the access to coal in England, England could start the Industrial Revolution. Because of the, um, the Haitian Revolution, Napoleon sold the Louisiana Purchase to America. It, it is sort of like these if-then statements. And so at one point I was like, if I could write like if then statements I could summarize like the entire history of the world, that would be like pretty cool. But then it was like a little bit too daunting. But then there was another part of it that was like if as like speculation, and there is this other part that is like history as this like never ending series of uh, like alternate like fantasy histories that are like um, like the Crusaders are like, if only we could convert China to Christianity, then China would declare war on the like Turks and the uh, Persians, and then we could have a unified Christendom. There's a lot of like weird like if then stuff that's like if as um, I'm trying to see if I can find some of them. If as like like a memory that never happened, um, like uh, or or something is constantly being displaced from like you lose labor somewhere so then you get it somewhere else or you lose this source of resources so you get it somewhere else. Um, but uh, I, I don't know, I think the more I read about history there was this element about of, like alternate history and this constant if, like, like you probably all know about Japanese American concentration camps here but we came very close to interning uh, Korean Americans during the Korean War and like I think there was even a law that was passed but then it was just like never executed or, or before 9-11, we were like on the verge of passing this huge hate crime law, and then like a few days later, 9-11 happened, and that was like done. Or uh, I, I have here written like when the Americans conquered Western Europe during World War II, Roosevelt was almost like, you know, we should just stay here. <laughs> that would be cool. <laughs> so I think part of the if was this sort of like memory that that could have happened in a different universe that was seemed like psychedelic. The, the sense in which I would want to invoke memory in terms of the, this fables project is that um, the, uh, memory of the structures of tale telling and of linguistic structures from my earlier earliest encounters with language, you know, from birth onward, and then since as a kid I read fairy tales and as a younger person I wrote fiction and then became a poet and essayist, to return to a mode that is a way of moving through language that is my, chi my child self's way. But to, so to literally, it's as if almost that the neurological structure of argumentation and fantasy that comes with 
uh, this form of, of stretched tale telling is, is a structure of linguistic making and of world making and perception that I don't remember, but I can step into as a navigational system again. So it's a curious double-bodied sensation I have when I write these that I'm not thinking about. Um, I'm thinking just like I'm my grown-up where I'm writing poems or essays and I'm moving toward figuring out what it is that needs to be said today. And, but the, my process of navigation is this uh, just kind of um, receive, I don't know what the, there must be like a structuralist, post-structuralist word for these, like the, the image repertoire of storytelling devices that are a kind of syntax that is, that I can re-inhabit and since it hasn't been aired in my life for so many decades, it, it, it has the rustiness and truth-telling capacity of things in archives that haven't been tampered with or corrected over the years. So it's not, me it's the memory of the, de of the device, it's the memory that the navigational device has, not the memories I put into the box of the piece. Well, I don't know if this is going to be a swerve um, from the pair, from Crocus's land. Um, and also the maps and, and thinking like 500, trying to hold 500 years also and more. Um, but I think that my motivation, I've been told by readers, friends of, of sort of the messy drafts of whatever I presented today that um, like I need to explain to my readers or listeners why I care or why I'm obsessing over these sort of textural tendrils around photos or why is accuracy so important or what motivates the, the foraging that I'm doing and the, and the fashion in which I'm presenting it. And, and it's like I'm just so focused on like gather now because time is running out. Um, quite literally like a lot of the photographers that I'm, I'm writing a sort of like photo history of lesbian and gay photographers from the last 25 years of the 20th century. So a lot of, like I would say, you know, more than a third of the photographers that I'm interested in are no longer living. And so like, the, and the other ones are, are older. And um, so there's that like sort of rush for memories, but then once you arrive, you know, like I did an oral history with Jeb this summer, but like, the memories are not necessarily um, factual, and and that's really interesting. Or like when I asked her about the nature of her lighting equipment in um, these photo shoots for her first book, Eye to Eye, she said, "I didn't bring lights." And I'm like, "Okay, well, um, in the tape recording, there's like I hear all this lighting equipment going off, and there's a child like talking about the lighting equipment." So then she was like, "Yeah, maybe I brought lights." And um, so that was like an interesting thing about the, the texture of memory. And I think that I'm, you know, you know like I just wrote this piece about the forms on contemporary photography of which I had a screen grab from in my um, presentation. And I literally saw like history being erased in some way um, where this curator was saying this photographer is unknown. And so I think there's this like urgency around gathering information um, along the spectrum of truth, untruth, accuracy, inaccuracy, and hopefully some, something comes out of it. Um, because I think erasure of like queer histories, black feminist histories is, is real. And I see it happening and it's sort of like how to, how to address it and also think about how like archives are Western constructs. So it's like even, you know, it's like even dialoguing with the New York Times also where it's like, you didn't attend to the real issues of talking about trans people today, which is like the epidemic of trans women of color being murdered, you know, and they don't talk about that in the review of the exhibition that celebrates artists who are trans and genderqueer, et cetera. So there's a lot of that sort of tension and, you know, like what is the authority of the archive? And, you know, I think on a personal level, in terms of family history, like, I don't have access to the vast majority of my family's history because of the Holocaust and because of trauma, because of, like, literally, like, records never 
being constructed. Like my mom doesn't have like a birth certificate, for example, and she like tried to find it. So things like that I think are, you know, what motivates it on a personal level. Um, I thought this could be a good time to open it up if people have questions. And um, we have this beautiful green taped microphone that I think if you want to ask a question, you I, don't, I hope this doesn't make it scary, you, that you would go up there to, just so, so that, because we're being recorded and forever. This, the memory of this will never fade away. It could, but at least not for the short present. But anyway, yes, would you like to ask a question? Yeah. If I was going to offer an example of writing in, in, in the style that you're describing, I would suggest W.J. Cash's Mind of the South, where he does what I think is a really great job of uh, explaining the subtlety of uh, social relations and social psychology of the South and how slavery anchored Southern society. And, and I thought he did it with his writing style, almost more than the logic of, of what he was doing. Um, uh, um, I spent most of my career as writing research reports. My, my stuff would never get through an editor if I wrote the way you do. <laughs> um, uh, and, and so I was wondering where that balance is uh, between uh, what I would describe as just verbal diarrhea and, 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 and a, a discursive analysis. Um, the, the second question I want to ask is, you know, it's, it's, I've heard read it many times that good writing is in the editing. How, how much editing do you do to produce a, you know, pieces like, like, like you did? Um, does, does it just come out as a flow, the way poetry sometimes emerges? I think poetry is edited as well. Uh, but uh, how do you, how do you what, what is the uh, creative process in producing that kind of work? I love verbal diarrhea. <laughs> yes. Um, no, I don't. I, I, um, I just say with editing, yeah, it's, it's I, the, in terms of like the spectrum of writing that one that I've done in my life between writing that behaves more like the, the, what you're calling discursive analysis or something, and then the other stuff, which I would certainly never call verbal diarrhea, but I would call um, literature, or just like a different kind of, <laughs> not, no offense, but just it's not, it's not, there is, that's not the way I would describe the vast realm of poetries and um, work, that, 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 that work, you know, editing per se, the quality of, uh, or the, it, the the meaningfulness of an utterance doesn't the edit, the amount of edit, yeah, but there's constant editing of anything that gets produced, including I th I'm sure factually everything that we've written is edited. With, you know, but it's again, it's not like you have to. Sh I think it's. I remember like the first time I was introduced to the notion of the discipline of creative writing, somebody once, the, the person who was in charge of inculcating freshmen into this practice said something like, you know, about revision, how important revision was. And of course revision is important. Like it's important that well, Tuesday happen after Monday and Wednesday after, the revision of moving forward in time has happened, but not as a, a sense of um, the requirement for entrance into sayability or readability. Um, I, I mean, the, the irony is that, like, I think a lot of these, like, this thing I write, it's all about discursiveness, actually. And so I feel like there's a lot of other things I've written that are, are aspire much more to be on in, in the diarrhea track of the, the bipolar thing that we described. And it's actually like, you know, this thing took a lot of editing, and it actually takes a lot more editing. There, there's certain things I write that are very that use elements of discursive tropes, like you know, analytical reason, and it's actually much harder to write or edit because it's like um, you, like trapping yourself at each step because you have to use the contour of kind of a logical argument to keep going. So the, those pieces that actually end up being much more edited, and um, and I you know I have a lot of experience writing things that are very discursive, including like grant applications and uh, 
you know, uh, litigation, like legal briefs and things like that. And I think the first time I started writing, I, I'm not a lawyer right now, but the first time I did that, it was really mind blowing to me because it's, I think as a writer, you aspire to like find your voice and like have some kind of body language to your writing and writing things like a grant report or uh, a lot of academic writing or legal writing, it's like that is all what must be expunged. But um, so people used to say, well, how did being a lawyer affect your writing? And I would say um, it like really killed my soul but in a like, really great way because it, I, it almost became like an experimental writing because I was like, oh, I, it's people, these lawyers, just, they just write like they're holding sledgehammers or something. It's just like relentless like argumentation, repetition. I was like, oh, maybe I can kind of you, treat that as like an exotic literary style. Um, and so I, I find that I almost often become more attracted to writing that um, is like, I, like clearly there's some kind of rigorous process going on, but it's, it eludes my ability to paraphrase it or su summarize or translate it. So I feel like I'm increasingly attracted to things on the, the diarrhea side of the spectrum because it, it is this, I, a lot of poetry I can quickly like assimilate it and uh, my ability to reason encompasses it too neatly. So I think for me, part of the attraction is to try to understand something that I don't understand. Well, I just wanted to say something briefly about um, process and editing. And um, I think that the editor um, can stand in as a metaphor for legibility or like this maybe false assumption that legibility is the goal. And that like when writing in between genres or, or playing with a prompt, like frolicking around in sort of poetic lassitudes, um, that you are sort of committed to a certain degree of illegibility through cross genreness and like that you can't please everyone basically. Um, and that depend and the editor is so it's a subjective person, so it's like this practice audience for um, who might read it or experience it and and a piece can change so much depending on who's editing it, you know? Yeah. Oh, another question? Yeah. Oh. Maybe related um, to this conversation. Um, it might be helpful if you could tell us what exactly you um, asked them to do. Like, yeah, well, I just asked all of the presenters to think about this prompt of the poem essay or the poet's essay. And just as I, I don't know if you were here in the beginning when I gave the introduction, but I talked about it as a class assignment, so it was, it was kind of a similar thing, like a vague sort of term. And, but then, obviously, I organized them into what I thought would be good groups. They, didn't, they weren't necessarily thinking of their groups when they wrote their pieces, right? They didn't even know. I mean, it was all yeah, behind my, whatever, psyche. <laughs> did, did, the, did you have access to the introduction that she gave us, her thinking of it? Yes. Um, for me, coming here, I have been obsessed with the intersection between essay and poetry um, for quite a long time. Actually, more on the side of people who write, quote, unquote, creative nonfiction. So I think one of the things that came up just now was the idea of not so much logic, but maybe, I, I'm going to say the word coherence. I'm not saying that I didn't follow what you were saying. Um, and also, having been in settings where people are talking about fiction and structure, et cetera, et cetera, the idea of narrative. So this was great to begin this way. I'm just curious if there might be more of a discussion of just the use of these terms. And it's for me coming from the different environments where people think of them differently. And you all have different ways in which you write. Sorry for the long explanation. My name is Deborah, Deborah Eater. I just want to mention that. But thank you all. And thank you. Could you 
maybe comment a little bit on what I've said? Does that make sense? I think, and, and I think Tracy Morris, who's one of our presenters, wanted to say something to Yeah. Okay. <laughs> second, second set. No, third, sec, yeah, shortly going to present, yeah. I'm not trying to get out of my lane or anything, but I just, I feel like, you know, maybe because I'm a teacher, but I have to sort of, I'm being a little nurturing and defending my colleagues here. You know, coherence is a subjective thing, and I've, I'm a little offended by the term verbal diarrhea because it implies scatological. So, and, and so, you know, I think what we're talking about is convention. We're talking about convention, not coherence, convention. And I think for people who are used to conventional approaches to language, that this is a master class in thinking outside of your conventions to people who know what they're talking about and know what they're doing, okay? And uh, it's an opportunity to hear differently. But I think all of us, all of this, is, this tells us about what the world outside of our coffee clutches and context understands what creative writing and innovation is. It's a very narrow bandwidth. But uh, it's, it's something to be embraced. It's not something that they need to feel defensive about or justified because it's not what you're accustomed to or anybody's accustomed to because of the narrow bandwidth of what people consider professional creative writing. And I'm not saying you, you intended it that way, but that's what it gave off to me. And I won't put pressure on them to defend it. I'm just articulating how I felt, how I received some of those comments. So it's like, how can we open it up so that people can receive different ways of approaching language differently as opposed to feel, and that's, those are choices of word usages that you guys made when you say coherence. I'm not saying that was your intention. Let me finish because I'm on the mic right now. I'm not saying that's not your intention, either of you, but I'm just, before we get into a lens of feeling like we have to justify innovative work, to just sort of hear it in an open kind of way. So that's, that's does that make sense? I mean, I'm just, I don't want it to go on in that lane because I'm not going to do anything. I don't think any of us are talking about conventionality in any way. So, so I'm, just, I'm just putting that out there. And if that's not your expectations, maybe this isn't the right context for you. But I suggest an openness of hearing as opposed to a presumption about whether or not the panelists know what they're doing because they do. Oh, oh and uh, yeah. But um, what, one thing is our uh, Dean Carol Becker also wants to add to this cover too. I take the power of the deanship to uh, interfere. No, um, I'm also a writer, so I, in this context, I'd like to be the writer. I, I, I feel like almost, um, and I wanna, I'm gonna build on what Tracy said a little, I think. It, it's almost as if, Dottie, your concept doesn't, I think you have a bigger, even a bigger ambition than changing our notion of what the essay could be. I feel like your ambition really is to change the notion of what reason can be, or how we understand reasonableness, or coherence, or integrity of thought, because what you're all doing, what we heard just now, are people approaching the way in which the mind works, and the way in which the mind understands the world in unique ways, and that we live in a culture, very utilitarian, society, which has one way of understanding what is reason and reasonableness and coherence, to Tracy's point. So I feel like what we're, what we're really doing, when you talk about the poet's essay at some level, is you're saying there are many ways to understand the world, and there are many forms of language that we don't attribute uh, the ability to understand the world. We see them as something else, but in fact, they're organizations of systems of thought as important to the way in which we are human as what we think of as a conventional essay or reasonable. So, I'm just throwing that in. Yeah, I love that. I agree with, with the, those points. Yeah, definitely hoping to challenge that and to challenge um, the scope, you know, because I think we do take for granted, I'm not supposed to be talking, but we do take for granted this idea of the essay or the five paragraph essay, and that becomes a frame on our imagination. So hopefully this is getting you to think about that differently. Yeah. 
Oh, you guys aren't. Yeah, we can do like a block of questions, so yeah. we can kind of make it less uh, adversarial. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Everyone. Just people just say their thing. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Maybe maybe two or three more people. Yeah. convention as a mandate to cohere or a kind of like social imperative and I was just wondering if maybe you could speak to the way that your work is envisioning a kind of social space if it's relinquishing a relationship to convention or relationship to reason and sort of reimagining what social space or anti-social space might look like. I just have some kind of thoughts I'll throw out since we're, it's like an open uh, forum. One of the things I was thinking about with, um, with Ariel and Ken's reading was the idea of a fugue, uh, because you, I mean, what you said, stacking is similar to, to the idea of just kind of returning and expanding. It also goes, kind of ties into what um, Professor Lasky was speaking about with the idea of um, the essay is an opportunity to, to ask questions and, and to not know, as opposed to to know. <laughs> And uh, I mean, I mean, I think the more I interrogate myself, the less I know, and the more I interrogate the world, the less I know. So um, that's one of my idea, uh, one of my kind of thoughts for you to consider. And then the other one is um, Michel Lyry, who I know you reference in your um, sorry to point. Uh, that's good. When you reference in your writing, and he, he uh, Lydia Davis just did the new translation of Scratches, and I was. Um, Kind of just thinking about that uh, when you're talking about subjectivity and how to how to um, yeah I think he's almost a master of the form I suppose and so one thing I would ask is just your ideas uh, to expand on your ideas of subjectivity and and uh, in the world and the last thing is uh, ideal forms uh, you know I I, I mentioned Lyrie but there, I'm sure there are other people that you deeply admire and perhaps um, one of those things might be interesting to you to what, what was that last bit? Was it a oh, yeah, favorite versions of the form? I suppose would be a way to say it. I guess I can start off. Um, the this question over here was about social histories and landscapes. If I'm remembering that correctly, done. Are we derailing your? Not at all. No, no, no. How about we respond to this and then we'll, oh. and then maybe we'll break. Yeah. Sorry, turn around. <laughs> it's okay. And um, the idea of the fugue, which is really beautiful and, and subjectivity. Yeah, I think um, I want to fold subjectivity into um, whatever essayistic writing that I'm doing about these photographic histories. And I think that I identify really strongly with uh, Jeb. Um, and I want to parse out that identification, even along its fissures. Um, we're both, we come from like sort of in terms of like listing identities, very similar backgrounds as like white, middle class, Jewish lesbians. And um, we're getting a time limit. Not at all. Okay. I was just, I was no. in a can, it was rude. Oh, okay, it's fine. Um, that's cool. And, and I think that, but also like adding a trans perspective and also trying to understand like how, um, you know, certain versions of white, lesbian, feminist collectivities and political resistances failed and, and how, um, you know, relationships and difference um, and not, you know, not having exact replicas of identities is like a sort of way to crack into thinking about coalition. And um, those are some of the things that are driving uh, how I construct this piece and the quandaries that abound within it and sort of speaking across history and thinking about how it relates to the present, so. Just it's striking me about like an overall comment about everything about this is that um, language itself and not to essentialize language across all of the different languages that have been and will be and that are, but the, the laws and behavioral gravities and tropisms of language require a lifetime's listening and are very com 
complicated and beautiful and are filtered through the histories of people who have used the language, the meanings, the formation of words, and that the larger responsibility I think that any writer or reader would feel is, is not to any gatekeeper or any even um, notion of what a genre requires, but just to um, all the voices and prior auditions that are contained within language when allowed to do its thing to some extent. And, um, and that I think that our role as, ling or as readers here, as linguistic investigators, is to have a certain quietness and humility in the face of language's um, protean wiliness and to behave, not that it is, that it, it doesn't know things, but it has temperatures and moods and prior knowledges and, you know, it's, it's, I think that that is the editor to whom we owe fealty as well as the, in a way, the, um, the force of either correctness or, it's the ethical, um, I don't know what the word is, the judge to whom we who behave in language must listen to is the judge that inheres in languages wily procedures, I think. Um, I, 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 I wanted to add one more thing about verbal diarrhea, uh, which is it made me think about um, like, one, like one potential, I'm going to be totally, I'm a total obviously fraud and dilettante, um, but to talk about a book I've only read part of, um, like one uh, origin of, you know, Western literature is uh, in Rabelais, and the main character is born, uh, I think, through his parents' anus, and it's like a sea of shit. And I think how perfect it is that, like, the origin of like m modern Western literature is like scatological, and that's not a book that you see assigned that much or you know read that much, but it is actually an, an exemplar of the essay form in that there, there's one part that's just a list describing like everything people you know is wearing or inventories, um, but it's all about shit. And uh, I think that part of it is about what the problem with scatology is it's excessive and there's a surplus meaning that comes with shittiness. And so I think maybe one way to think about like le legibility or convention, and I think these are really useful. I wrote down Tracy Moore, thank God Tracy Morris with a heart around it. Um, what? Why, why, well, well, why not overdo it? But a balance isn't, balance isn't required of works of art, you don't say of um, Picasso, that he should have ha had more um, Leonardo in him. You don't say of uh, an outhouse that it should have more of a cathedral in it. You don't say of a work by Wayne Kustenbaum that it should have more of um, Dorothy Alasky in it. I pray that it could have some. You don't, you don't, you don't make from outside the organism and integrity of a work of art or a person who created it judgments about what it should hold or what, how it should be measured. That's a, a, an extremely closed and um, suspicious way of viewing the diversity of human articulation. That's the way I see it. We have all day. I mean, this is just the beginning. Yeah, panel. So excited to see what's going to happen next. Um, if you come back in about 15 minutes, it won't be perfectly 15 minutes, but 16, but as close to 15 as possible. Um, we're going to hear about the essay, The Manifesto, and the Poetic Imagination from Tracy Morris, Anais Duplan, and Raquel Salas Rivera. So we will um, <laughs> see you soon. Oh, Rivera. Sorry.